It's 2020 and open world games are as big as ever. Ton of great new ones come in this year. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks, the top 10 new open world games of 2020. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started, there's a few games we are excluding from this. Final Fantasy VII's remake, for instance, it's going to be grand in scale, but it doesn't necessarily look like an open world. Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines 2 is a series of hubs. And we aren't going to talk about Elder Scrolls 6 because there's very little chance we'll see that this year. Starting off at number 10 is No More Heroes 3. It's been 10 years since the previous numbered entry and takes place two years after Travis Strikes Again, which came last year. If you're unfamiliar, No More Heroes is an action adventure hack and slash game basically intended to kind of be a humorous take on comic book stuff. It's kind of hard to explain in a short period of time but the gameplay is a lot of fun. These are really good hack and slash games that will most likely put a smile on your face one way or the other. It does get a little extreme sometimes, but not. It could be worse. You've seen worse. No More Heroes 3 is coming out on the Nintendo Switch sometime this year. And moving on to number nine is Dying Light 2, which looks to actually add a very large amount of ideas to an already pretty good game, Dying Light 1. Of course, we will be seeing the parkour skills of the original game remain. They're actually doubling the number of parkour moves. But the big development is the emphasis on narrative. They are attempting to do something pretty ambitious, to say the least. They want to make a story that is significantly more reactive to players' choices than what you might expect. The developers are calling it a narrative sandbox, which gives you choices that have genuine consequences. Now, keeping in mind we've played games that have advertised this idea for a very long time, and while we have been presented choices in games, it doesn't always live up to the rhetoric, so to speak. The thing that makes me interested in this is that it's not really something that developers and publishers have tried to sell us on lately. So that makes me think that the technology they've developed here is significant. Also, it's Dying Light, so we already know that the gameplay itself is probably going to be good because they've built on that. Dying Light 2 has sadly been delayed from its initial spring release. Techland and Square Enix have delayed it because they say the game needs more time and they're not sure exactly how much, so currently it's delayed indefinitely. Not that they're canceling it or anything like that, I'm sure they'll give us more information soon, but we don't know when it's going to come out as of right now. Coming in at number 8 is Everwild, a new game from Rare. Graphically speaking, you can really tell looking at Everwild the mark that Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild has left on the gaming world. In fact, several of the games we'll mention today actually do that same thing. There's not a ton of information on this game out right now. We know it's an action adventure game. We know it's open world. We know it's very pretty. And Rare purports it to offer engaging and meaningful experiences. Now, I would hope that basically any game on some level, whether it be through gameplay, enjoyment, brings you some sort of meaningful experience. I mean, just simple fun is meaningful. We will obviously keep you updated as we find out more about this game. We don't have a release date. It's exclusive to Xbox. Microsoft owns Rare at this point, but we're supposed to see it sometime this year. Coming in at number seven is Gods and Monsters. Comes to us from the creators of Assassin's Creed Odyssey for Ubisoft. This is another game, like I said, that you can really feel the weight of Zelda Breath of the Wild on, except for it is Greek themed. And in truth, there's a lot of things I think are really intriguing about this. We've seen the sort of types of open world games that Ubisoft makes, but they typically don't go for such a distinct aesthetic in those games. Yes, some of them they have dove into that. There are a few Ubisoft games that have really gone for it, aesthetically speaking, and they're very pretty. But I would say that this game really stands out. There's really nothing like this in the Ubisoft catalog. And if we know kind of what we're getting gameplay-wise when comparing it to Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and knowing that the developers from that game are the ones working on this, taking this cartoon aesthetic and making it about monsters and about defeating monsters, honestly, in my opinion, is really intriguing. Gods and Monsters is coming to PC, Xbox One, PS4, and Nintendo Switch, and is coming sometime fall 2020. At number 6 is Mount and Blade 2 Bannerlord. This is a game that was announced way back in 2012. Like its predecessor, it is an action role-playing game with an emphasis on strategy. What this basically means, if you've ever played the original, is that it's kind of a management-slash-strategy game. It's kind of a sandbox. 
but mostly it's an action RPG. Which sound like three pretty disparate things, but when the original Mountain Blade came out in 2008, it wasn't really like graphically a powerhouse in any way, and it got a lot of guff for that. But the way the game was set up was more than intriguing, it was a really enjoyable game. And it's really nice to see that same idea brought into much better looking graphics because even for 2008, it was not a good looking game. I don't think it's going to win any awards for graphics. It's just such a turnaround that comparing the two games, it's like, wow, there's a lot of new stuff to look forward to in it as well, which gives a much more combat oriented experience. But that doesn't mean it's a different game altogether. In the single player, you will be able to persuade people. A well-executed persuasion system can really drastically improve a narrative, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm just looking forward to playing it, though. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is releasing in March for early access. We don't have a final date, but look for it on Steam then. And at number 5 is Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. This is a game that has a lot of expectations, and for a lot of people, meets them. But it's not necessarily for everyone. Let's just say the start's a little bit slow, but in my opinion, when it gets going, it's really a worthwhile game. It's not perfect, but this is a retelling of the full Dragon Ball saga that I'm not really upset about the level of imperfection. For me, it's a game that needed to be made and is a satisfyingly made game. It's not gonna rock your socks off with new features or anything. It's an open world game. It delivers some high octane Dragon Ball combat. It has an enjoyable game loop. And honestly, for me, I don't care that it's not the most innovative thing I've ever played. It's just one really cool looking game that gives you the entire Dragon Ball saga. I enjoy the hell out of it. I'm not gonna tell you that it's perfect or that absolutely every person's gonna like it, but just for how faithful and how fun this game is, in my opinion, kind of overcomes the lack of innovation. It's pretty much the best Dragon Ball story video game, in my opinion. It's out now for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. I would definitely recommend playing it. At number four, it's Watch Dogs Legion. We talked about how there are some games that have done a good job creating a look, and the Watch Dogs series has done exactly that. This one in particular looks to really take the ball and run with it though. Watch Dogs Legion is set in a hypothetical alternate future Britain where Brexit has taken everybody in a police state direction. The game focuses on creating a resistance to the police state, which is obviously powered by CTOS, the operating system that the series is based around. This is taking the Grand Theft Auto V route and giving us multiple protagonists to play as. Personally, I think that's a good move for this game particularly. If anything, I think that it actually lends itself for that kind of story more so than even Grand Theft Auto. If we're talking about building a hacker resistance, then only seeing one person's perspective on that might actually get kind of boring after a while. But the characters themselves look to bring more than just narrative differences. They actually will have different skills. And honestly, I think that this may be a landmark game for the Watch Dogs franchise. It's hitting PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, Windows and Stadia sometime this year. Number three is Elden Ring, the collaboration between From Software and George R.R. Martin. This is kind of the From Software open world experiment. Will the Souls-like formula essentially work with the world wide open? In some respects, I think we've seen a little bit of a preview of what we may see with Elden Ring, with Ashen, albeit with an entirely different aesthetic, story, etc. But what I think a lot of people are particularly interested in is the George R.R. R. Martin collaboration. The way that worked out is George R.R. R. Martin apparently did the world-building elements of it, and Miyazaki and From basically filled in the actual story beat by beat. I think that's a pretty interesting way of doing a collaboration, and I have some pretty high hopes for Elden Ring, honestly. From Software's never really let us down before, why would it start now? Elden Ring will be out sometime this year on Windows, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. At number two is Ghost of Tsushima, which is an action-adventure game with a stealth twist. Basically, this was revealed, and I was already ready for it. It is absolutely a gorgeous-looking game. It comes to us via Sucker Punch Productions and follows the last samurai on Tsushima Island back in the 13th century. 
Now, the central conflict of the game is apparently the Mongol invasion of Japan. The game is more or less about the fantasy of becoming a samurai, in which you will, over the course of the game, learn the way of the ghost, which is apparently a prerequisite for defeating the Mongol Empire. Plenty about this game remains a mystery for now, but if you recall, Sucker Punch created the infamous series and apparently it's serving as the inspiration for the transversal techniques that the main character of this game will be employing, so I think that can give us a little bit of a hint as to how the game will play. We also know there's a heavy stealth element, and that just comes out of the words of the developers themselves, so combining these two things makes me very interested. On top of that, like I said, Ghost of Tsushima is gorgeous. It's coming to PlayStation 4 in quarter two or quarter three of this year. And finally, the granddaddy of them all, probably the biggest game of the year, probably the game that we all want to play the most, it's Cyberpunk. Of course. Like, you knew this was coming. I don't know what I can say about Cyberpunk that we haven't already said. I don't know how you could not know what it is, but just to distill it, it looks a lot like first-person Grand Theft Auto in the coolest looking city of all time. To say I'm ready to jump into the world of cyberpunk is such a massive understatement. I cannot wait. It's going to be landing on Windows, PS4, Xbox One, and Stadia on April 16th. A quick bonus game for you. It's not quite the same thing. It's Microsoft Flight Simulator. The reason we don't say it's quite the same thing is because you're flying. I mean, it's definitely very cool that you'll be able to fly around all over the place. That's not a new thing for Flight Simulator, but it's been a while. It's definitely cool to see a new Flight Simulator game coming out. Yakuza Like a Dragon, which is a totally new type of Yakuza game, and will not feature real-time combat. Instead, it's a turn-based JRPG-style combat, which is really a bold choice that I'm pretty interested in seeing, to be honest. Next is Animal Crossing New Horizons, which is a bigger and better version of the classic life sim that absolutely everybody who owns a Nintendo product at least knows of. But a lot of people really love this series. Of course, I think basically everybody with a Nintendo Switch is at least curious at this point. There's an unannounced Assassin's Creed game that is apparently coming in 2020. It is rumored to take place during the Viking era. There's a lot of speculation it will be called Assassin's Creed Ragnarok, but none of that is even vaguely confirmed, so keep that in mind. Honestly, I do think that would be a great era to do an Assassin's Creed in, especially given the depth that we've seen in Odyssey and Origins. What games are you going to play this year? What are you most excited for? Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. And if you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We have a lot of brand new videos every day of the week. And the best way to see them first is, of course, the subscription. So click subscribe and enable all notifications. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.